at this point, we should move on and talk a little bit about uh, earlier stage disease and how uh, therapies are developing. And uh, this year at uh, the ESMO meeting in particular, uh, we've had new information regarding stage 3B, um, non-small cell lung cancer. So looking at that history a little bit, um, we go from what is largely palliative care um, and palliative intent therapy to curative intent stages, and 3B is that marginal stage just at the tip, um, the most advanced uh, of the uh, previously untreated patients with uh, still regional, uh, regionally confined disease. Um, the therapy of choice is concurrent chemoradiation, and we have a long history that many of us have participated in of trying to improve outcomes. And so adding more chemo up front, adding consolidation chemotherapy was tried, um, adding targeted therapies was tried, uh, dose escalation of radiation all the way up into the high 70 gray um, was uh, not successful. Um, and uh, uh, other approaches such as adding cetuximab um, were also not uh, uh, successful. So in a way we've had some stagnation where we do cure people, um, but uh, that cure rate is at three years of about uh, 25 to 30 percent. So what uh, was presented this year at the ESMO meeting and is now published is the so-called Pacific trial where uh, patients with previously untreated uh, stage 3B disease after completion of chemoradiation were randomized to placebo versus dovalumab. And uh, the data that were presented uh, showed a uh, marked increase in progression-free survival of um, about uh, five and a half to 16 and a half months, uh, so stretching by 11 months, the uh, so progression-free survival. We don't know about survival, um, but as progression-free survival goes, this is really a, a novel and impressive finding uh, that is unmatched in the literature by anything else like it in the last 15 years or so, if not longer. Um, so we should talk a little bit about this trial, and, and maybe all of us should, should comment. How do we view these data, um, the, the toxicity spectrum, which was mild, um, or typical for the value map, but certainly not suggestive of a major interaction with the just recently completed chemo RT. Um, and uh, does this define this as a new standard at this point, or do we need to wait longer? Do we need more, more data? So, uh, Ram, would you, would you like to start? Sure, uh, Everett. I was uh, very impressed with the results of the Pacific study overall. And uh, it goes back to an issue you had earlier brought up during this conversation about the so-called abscopal effect. When you give radiation, does it make the immune system uh, more likely to respond to a checkpoint inhibitor? Does radiation increase the inflammation in the tumor? Uh, we don't know the exact mechanisms, but all of these or some of these could be in play here where giving a checkpoint inhibitor right after, console, after chemo radiotherapy uh, results in a significant improvement in progression-free survival. I was also happy to see that the toxicity was not uh, increased by the adding, by addition of immune checkpoint inhibitor in the setting. Another point that came out from the trial was that the PDL1 expression didn't seem to matter. Both patients with low and high PDL1 expression uh, benefited from getting the uh, Dervolumab maintenance or consolidation therapy, however you call it. So I think that these results uh, come as uh, a very refreshing step forward in a disease where we have been uh, stuck with stagnation, and I think it will be incorporated into clinical practice. So I think um, to, it's it's important to to appreciate you know uh, you know how 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 many patients this actually would impact, right? If you, can, if you think that. Of all, you know, non-small cell lung cancer, 50% is metastatic, 25%, you know, sort of locally advanced, and and 25% uh, is early stage. I mean, this, that locally advanced group represents actually a bigger population than those eligible for first-line pembrolizumab, right? Mm -hmm. That 30% of 50%. So it's a lot of patients that um, that this is going to impact, and I think the decision around surgery. Uh, versus chemotherapy and radiation therapy is, is often a, uh, a tough one. But I think that 
Um, most patients, uh, you know, are, are unresectable. They're unresectable because they have 3A disease and they have pulmonary function tests that preclude resection or comorbidities that preclude resection or too many, too extensive nodal involvement um, or their 3B with, with, with contralateral um, disease. And, um, you know, for those patients, um, after chemotherapy and radiation therapy, consolidation chemotherapy hasn't worked. Um, adjuvant vaccine therapy, BLP25 didn't work. Well, nothing has moved the bar for this patient population, uh, which with most of them having micrometastatic disease, um, clearly so. To, so to see a, a trial with 11 month progression-free survival difference is, you know, is massive. And I think it's, it's going to be the new standard of care. And uh, although it's, the data is not mature enough to have overall survival data, it's almost impossible in my mind to think that there isn't going to be an overall survival benefit. If you hit PFS with an immunotherapy agent, you're going to hit OS. Does the uh, timing of the randomization influence your interpretation of this trial? That, that it happened after people had completed chemo RT and uh, you know one, one specific was that they had not progressed, right? That they at least had stable disease. Um, does that make it a real world trial? I think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's I think the majority of patients um, who receive, you know, you end up staging them, the PET scan, brain MRI to make sure they have stage three unresectable disease and they, they, you know, they largely respond to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, you know, um, so I, I think it's I think it's real world. I, I thought what was interesting from from the data though is that um, those patients that um, that were randomized within two weeks of finishing the radiation therapy, you know, it looked like their hazard ratio was actually a little bit better than those patients who were randomized more than two weeks, suggesting there really is some synergy. Um, going on between whether it's the radiation or the chemo or both. And so trying to um, move your treatment with the Dervalumab adjuvantly in as soon as possible is, is, is important. Fred? I do agree with uh, what has been said. It is certainly very encouraging results uh, in a disease group where we haven't seen any progress for many, many, many years. But um, I would like to, uh, we are talking about a, a disease group where a subgroup are potentially cured. And um, I'm, I'm still missing, uh, of course, two m important parameters. One, as we have talked about overall survival, I would like to see the overall survival data. Two, I would like to see the quality of life data. Does the, the improvement of uh, PFS also lead to a better performance uh, for the patients? Uh, we don't know that. There hasn't been presented yet those data. So I think uh, those two uh, data set would be uh, would be very important. Um, I'm a believer that uh, this this uh, data will um, lead to a game changing uh, of this group of patients. But um, I think th there are a lot of people who want to see survival data and quality of life data before. So they will, of course, come and uh, formal quality of life data, I, I don't know, but the comparison of toxicities between the two arms were, were not, as far as I saw, suggestive that quality of life would be negatively impacted um, by, by the treatment, um, although I think the, the cough rate was a little bit higher and maybe, maybe some higher pneumonitis rate. Um, but until the survival data are there, and the progression-free survival data are what they are, um, and you now see a patient. Um, what, what are you going to tell the patient? No, I think uh, you cannot ignore those uh, results. And I think, uh, as has been said uh, by Ram and Nair, that uh, certainly I think many places tomorrow will certainly consider 
uh, changing their their um, treatment plan uh, to this to this um, uh, regimen. But uh, I don't know how how uh, the the penetration. I I don't I don't know. If I saw p a patient tomorrow, I certainly would would uh, consider it. Uh, but again, there are two data sets which are crucial. That, that we'll need to eventually get. Roy, what are your thoughts? Well, not much to add, although I will say you're right. This is a selected group of patients because they took the patients after what's quite a good fit test, uh, you know, getting through chemo radiation because many of those patients will have toxicities and other issues. And also, some patients do progress through that. I've, I've seen my share. That said, the two groups were equal and they're, they're randomized. And, I, and we'll treat based on the trial uh, eligibility. So in that group of patients, I thought the result was historic. You know, the, the difference was quite large. Certainly we do want to see survival eventually and, and at least make sure that it's trending in the right direction. Remember, in the real world, hopefully these patients are getting immunotherapy at some point in their life. Um, but, I, but I think that um, I would, you know, certainly as soon as there's an approval and a reimbursement uh, 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 available, I would recommend this to those patients and, and use it.